everyone. Uh, my name is Shanice. I am a Career and Student Success Advisor Coordinator from Humber College. Um, and welcome to the 2S LGBTQ plus career conversations, um, our Faculty of Social and Community Services alumni panel event um, as a part of our National Career Month. Um, so this event is planned by Humber's Advising and Career Services team, as well as the LGBTQ plus Resource Center. Um, this is our second time hosting this panel event, um, and we're super thrilled to be having a new focus this semester and focusing on our Humber alumni from the Faculty of Social and Community Services. Um, and we have a great group of panelists today who are excited to share their experiences um, and kind of chat to you today about, um, you know, their career journey so far. Um, before we dive in, I just want to go over some housekeeping details quickly. Um, okay. Uh, so for the first hour or so of the event, it will be a guided conversation with our moderator and the panelists, uh, who will all be introduced shortly. Uh, following the conversation, we'll have an opportunity for the audience Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout, definitely feel free to enter them into the chat, um, or you can unmic yourself at the end of the conversation. Um, please keep your cameras and mics off during the conversation. Um, the session will also be recorded. Um, the Q&A portion of the conversation will not be recorded. Um, if you want to turn on your closed captioning, just click on the three dots on the menu bar of your screen and select turn on live captions. Um, and just a friendly reminder to please uh, respect this space, uh, this conversation, uh, make sure that you're respecting others in the space and yourself as well. Um, and yeah, if you need to be, if you need to check in with anyone, definitely feel free to um, take a moment to step back um, if you need a break from any of the conversations. Um, but with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Matthew, who's going to do um, our land acknowledgement. So Matthew, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, as Shanice mentioned, my name is Matthew Travel. I'm the coordinator for the LGBTQ plus resource centers here at Humber. Um, and I'll be starting off with our land acknowledgement today. I apologize if there's some noise in the background. I'm in the resource center today and it's pretty busy. <laughs> um, so Humber College is located within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobico, the place of the alders in Michisagig language. The region is uniquely situated along the Humber River watershed, which historically has provided an integral connection for the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wyandotte peoples between Ontario Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe, Georgian Bay regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobico continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. So as folks have seen from the title of our event today, today's event is meant to uplift and highlight 2S LGBTQ voices within our community. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that the imposition of binary gender roles by colonizers and the forced assimilation into gender norms have erased um, and marginalized non-binary and gender non-conforming ident identities and ways of being. Um, I mentioned this to highlight the ongoing fight for trans rights and liberation and its interconnection with ongoing struggles of Indigenous sovereignty and decolonization. Um, when giving land acknowledgements, I also think it's really important for us to be reminded of the fact that we are a post-secondary institution. Um, and while it's obviously important for post-secondary institutions to give land acknowledgements in the form of recognition and respect for Indigenous peoples and their lands, it's also important for us to realize that these institutions themselves are pillars of white supremacy and colonialism, um, and that post-secondary institutions have historically and continue to um, perpe perpetuate systems of oppression and marginalization, including the erasure of peoples and their knowledge. So before I pass it over to Christine, I want to also highlight um, a fact that is happening this week, and that is that um, on March 31st, it is uh, Trans Day of Visibility. Um, the LGBTQ Plus Resource Center has a variety of different events happening this week, um, all mainly designed to uplift and celebrate um, the trans students in our community. Um, if you're interested in ever learning more about what's going on, feel free to just come on by the resource centers. 
um, and we're happy to fill you in on all the different programs and different ideas we have going on. So now I'm going to shift into the intro of our moderator. So our moderator today is Christine Sue. Um, Christine uses she, her, and they, them pronouns. Christine is a first generation immigrant settler invested in dismantling white supremacy culture and committed to faci facilitating relational healing work across communities with the goal for tenderness and exploration of what it looks like, sounds like, feels like to thrive. She is also a gender fluid queer woman of color living with an invisible disability, which heavily informs their intersectional and trauma informed approach to the work they do. They facilitate and advocate for social change through social justice liberation work across all contexts and levels, from grassroots, community spaces, to working in human resources in a nonprofit, post secondary institutions, and corporate sectors. Their subject matter expertise in 2S LGBTQIA inclusion, particularly in sport and healthcare, as well as in the workplace with a focus on systems change and collective care for the queer and trans communities. Currently, she is an executive and co-founding member of Flags for Glory, a gender inclusive queer flag football league, and is one of the administrators for Jobs for Queers on Facebook, helping to decrease barriers for employment, especially for trans and non-binary people of color. Due to being trapped in capitalism, they live a multi-gig life as one of the managing partners of an equity, diversity, and inclusion consulting firm called Challenge Accepted, and work as a facilitator, coach, training, and consultant for a few organizations such as Canadian Women and Sport, Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport, and Sheena's Place. They are an Ontario certified educator and conflict mediator with a Bachelor of Physical Education, oh sorry, with a Bachelor of Physical and Health Education from University of Toronto, a Bachelor of Education from Ontario Institute of Studies in Education, and an Adult Education Certificate from St. Francis Xavier University. So with all that, I will pass it over to Christine. Thank you, and thank you for reading through the very long bio that I realized just now. <laughs> Appreciate um, that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, it's, it's a really great uh, honor and privilege to be here, especially having worked at Humber before. So some folks may recognize me uh, from having worked at Humber. Um, I'm excited to be here to have a have these conversations with our panelists here. And uh, in order to do that, of course, it's important for um, some introductions for who we're speaking to and with today. Um, and so I'm going to just be reading out loud the bios um, here. Um, so the first panelist that we have here is Kayla Logan. She uses she, her pronouns. Um, Kayla Logan is a Barbie girl in the corporate world. Life in Zoom, it's fantastic. She spends her Monday to Friday working as a team lead for Shack Shine, uh, a house detailing company at uh, O2E Brands. Um, she is the first openly queer person to be hired at Shack Shine, and she waves her flag happily at the office. Prior to working in sales, Kayla was a paintable ceramics instructor and a primary special education classroom volunteer while completing her developmental services worker diploma, as well as her honors uh, bachelor's of behavior science. Both were completed at Humber. Kayla is passionate about creating safe spaces for people of all walks of life, warmly welcoming newcomers to Canada to her team at Shrek Shine and actively ensuring it is an 2S LGBTQ2 plus friendly environment. She strongly aligns with her work's core values of passion, integrity, professionalism, and empathy, and incorporates these into her leadership and how she advocates for her team. She would also like to give a shout out to her coworker and friend, Manjo Dillon, for helping her come up uh, with this bio that speaks to her personal brand as a femme queer surviving corporate Canada. Um, feel free to use a react button to welcome our panelists. Um, I know I certainly will be using that. Um, Wonderful. And next up, we have uh, D. Marksman Philpotts. They use they them pronouns. Um, D is a black number binary creative and academic. They started their journey at Humber College in the comedy writing and performance program. They also obtained a diploma in child and youth 
Care from uh, Humber College, their bachelor's degree in sexuality studies at York University, and is currently doing their master's in social work at York University and hopes to graduate this April. They have experience working in various parts of the social se services sector, such as school boards, community work, disability, and the arts. They are currently working as a research assistant at York University and Toronto Metropolitan University on two research projects focusing on two SLGBTQ plus communities. Dee is committed to their research and work in the Black community, specializing in the equitable investigations of Black queer individuals and the notion of anti-Black racism in institutional settings. Dee also works with young people who experience anti-Black racism, gender-based violence, queer and transphobia, and poverty. Their goal is to be able to work with Black community members who hold multiple intersections in their identity to see justice and thrive. And again, I welcome folks to so feel free to use the reaction button to welcome Dee to our conversation here today. And lastly, we have Stephen Oliver. He uses the he him pronouns. Stephen is a substance use counselor for youth at the YMCA of Greater Toronto's YSAP program in downtown Toronto. He graduated from Humber College's Addictions and Mental Health Postgraduate Certificate, Certificate Program after completing a degree in psychology and neuroscience at McMaster University. For the past five years, Stephen has worked in housing and addictions programs supporting diverse populations at various organizations, but found a particular passion for using his lived experience as a gay man to support 2 SRGBTQ plus youth with their mental health and substance use concerns. Stephen aims to create a therapeutic space for young people to express themselves authentically, process trauma, and find healing in a relational context. In his spare time, Stephen enjoys eating with his long-term partner, cooking, fantasizing about how he could have been a pop star and snuggling with his two hooligan kitties, Tiger and Snow Pea. Hopefully we'll get to see them today. <laughs> um, and again, I'll welcome folks to use a reaction button to welcome Stephen to our conversation today. Shift over with some questions we've prepared um, for today. Um, and I'll explicitly say that uh, this is going to um, be a a conversation where I'll invite folks to feel free to use the chat function um, to provide some comments, encouragement, and if there are specific follow-up questions that folks have, feel free to use the chat to um, uh, communicate them. Um, but first, of course, uh, we would like to hear from the panelists here. Um, we'll start with Stephen. Um, please tell us about yourself and your current role. What are some highlights you have experienced since graduating Humber and starting your career journey? So feel free to just elaborate on what was shared from your bio or if there's any highlights you want to talk about. Sure. First, I just want to say y'all have such really awesome careers yourselves. This is so cool to be in a conversation with the three of you. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all this work you're doing. Um, why am I here? Um, but uh, I think um, some... So a bit about my current role, yeah, I think I'm a substance use counselor with YSAP. Um, we, I'm just going to plug my program a little bit. Um, we offer like one-on-one -on -one counseling for young people between the ages of 14 and 24 who are either having an issue with a substance that they're using or are, you know, looking for some support. Um, we also do presentations and workshops in the community. We're a free program, self-referral, so it's a super low barrier and um, it allows us to kind of, uh, we offer it from a harm reduction perspective as well, which is pretty unique about our program. And so um, I really kind of like the populations that we get to serve in the work that uh, I'm doing. Um, some highlights since I graduated included, I mean, getting a job in my field was, was super exciting because I was worried that that was not gonna be something following graduation. Um, so my first job was at a men's shelter, and then I moved to the city and started working at a youth shelter because I wanted to work more with young people. Um, I ended up get that started out as part time and then switched to full time, which was great. Um, I worked at a queer specific organization, which was also a really great experience. And then um, the biggest highlight is being in this position that I'm currently in. Um, I went into ADMH wanting to get like with a goal of getting into psychotherapy eventually. And so I always wanted to be doing this sort of one on one work with young people. Um, and so when I first moved to the city, I heard about this position and interviewed for it and I didn't get it, but took a few more years of experience and, and accepting the reality that that was going to be sort of the, the trajectory for me that um, I just kept plugging away at it. and. Um, I'm here now. So I've been in this role now for, I'm coming up on a year as of Tuesday next week, I'll have been a counselor. So I'm like so jazzed. This is like the dream job for me. 
I've been so happy with it. And so I'm just, I'm just really, really, it's like the biggest highlight for me has been this. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Stephen. And congrats on your dream job. Um, next up, let's have Dee share um, and, and in response to the same question as well. Please. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I just want to echo Stephen. Y'all are pretty cool. Pretty cool cats out here. Um, so for me, I am in grad school. Um, so that's kind of what I do most of the time. But I have had the privilege to be able to do a lot of research um, since I left Humber. Um, going to university at York, I was able to kind of hone in on specific research that I wanted to do. Um, and I really kind of fell in love with the idea of troubling Black queer sexuality um, and gender expansiveness. And I dug my teeth in and really, really got into that. And I realized that I wanted to kind of get more into the research world, get more into teaching. Um, so that's kind of where that took me. My social work degree that I'm doing right now, which is um, my master's, um, I've been able to, you know, to guest lecture in folks' classrooms. Um, I was able to kind of jump on some research projects, which are Canada-wide research. Um, the biggest one I'm doing right now is, is it's about two, $2.4 million research on 2S LGBTQ people in poverty um, throughout Canada, which is really important work. Um, we're really trying to understand the barriers that um, queer folks are having um, finding jobs, living, affording affording their lives at this point. Um, so that is a really big passion project for me that I'm I get to work on. Um, yeah, it's it's been a really interesting journey since leaving Humber. I did not think I would be here um, <laughs> at all. Um, I was a, I was very discouraged from pursuing post secondary um, due to my identities when I was a lot younger. So getting to this point and kind of being an academic um, is is a real, it's a real feat. It's a real feat. Awesome, thank you, Dee. And uh, it's a privilege to have you be part of those conversations and, and really push the envelopes in, in the academic, academia type institutions, recognizing that it is definitely quite difficult there. So thank you for doing that work. Uh, last up, we have Kayla, please. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Um, Stephen and Dee, it is such an honor to be here with you both. You are lovely people and the work you're doing is so beautiful. So, ooh, um, my job is not nearly as exciting. <laughs> but um, my name is Kayla. I work in a sales center for Shack Shine, which is a house detailing company. Um, I'm the team lead, so it's kind of a step down from manager and it's more kind of on the floor with my uh, teammates. Um, it's very exciting. It's very uh, fast paced because it's a corporate job, but it's, um, it's fun. I get to support people's career journeys in how they want to develop in our company or outside of that. Um, I get to help them develop skills. I do a bit of coaching and a big part of what I've been doing at Shackshine. This is my cat. Sorry. She also wants to talk about her experience at Shackshine. <laughs> Um, a big part of what I've been doing that has been really fun is making it a more open space. Um, Shackshine and O2E brands, for those of you who are familiar, um, they're really big on the culture in their workplace and it's really all about people where we are. Um, and I felt that there was kind of something missing about making it more open to queer communities. So a big highlight for me and a big win in my job was including something in our job description for new hires that were a uh, to us LGBTQ plus safe environment, um, which had a really big impact on the people who were coming to apply for us because applying to a corporate job specifically in, I think a field that is very, very straight male dominated, such as house detailing can be a little bit intimidating. Um, so putting that out there and saying, hey, like we are a very friendly environment had such a big impact on what we've been doing. So that's a big highlight for me, um, even though I'm not working directly in my field, like there are things that I've learned from being in the Faculty of Social and Community Services. And I think, I feel like all of us in that faculty are very empathetic <laughs> as well, maybe to a fault, um, which kind of has helped me develop my team at Shackshine. Um, yeah, that's a big highlight for me in my career journey. And I'm just really excited to be here with everyone. <laughs> 
Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. And it's uh, having been in the corporate sector, I can understand and empathize the uh, the amount of work that you're doing. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so we'll move now into the second question here. And I think all of you have very much touched on the significance of your identities and experiences that have shown up in a variety of different ways and how you folks utilize that, whether it's central to your work um, and or central to how you show up at work. So um, I'll read out the question, but feel free to pivot, expand, or add in your own questions for each other if you'd like. Um, so here's the question. How has your identity been an important or meaningful piece of your career development? Um, secondly to that, if you'd like to answer this, how have you navigated disclosure and ownership of your identity or identities, multiple identities, of course, we're complex folks um, in the workplace. So we'll start with that for now and uh, see where the conversation takes us. And to start, uh, let's have Dee start this conversation. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, this is a really big question for me. Um, a lot of my work really does center on my identities, the multiple, multiple intersections of my identity. Um, I'll say, Something that I noticed was that within um, 2SLGBTQ plus communities, um, there was a real lack of conversation around anti-Blackness. Um, and I knew that that was something that I had to kind of investigate a lot more. Um, I really, really, really thought it was important to emphasize that and really trouble um, those communities. And so a lot of the work that I do ultimately centers around that. Um, I think that in certain spaces and places that I do end up going into, I am often the only black face. Um, as I mentioned in the research team that I, I'm working on, I'm literally the only black person and the team is large. It's like maybe like 25 people. Um, and it, yes, <laughs> I saw your faces. Yeah, so that's really troubling. Um, and, uh, I'm always consistently the person who has to be like, folks have multiple identities. We're forgetting about that. We're forgetting about barriers that we're putting up in place of, in, of trying to reach people. Um, a lot of it's like accessibility. Folks who are disabled, how are they going to be able to have conversations with us? How are we going to be able to reach out to them? Folks who don't feel safe talking to white researchers often, like how are we going to impact them and bring them into the conversation? Um, so that part of my identity is always in the room um, wherever I go, um, because often, more often than not, I have to bridge that gap and allow people to be able to come into the work that's being done, um, especially within um, a research context. Um, and disclosure and ownership, I guess, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really gay. Um, I love that. <laughs> I just, I just be here. I'm out here. Um, and, uh, like my blackness is here. It's, it's everywhere. You see it, right? Um, when I, uh, when people kind of talk to me or when they, um, interact with me it's 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 in the forefront so um i often don't feel the need to disclose i guess in the sense um it just kind of comes out <laughs> i just be talking you know i talk about my cats and people are like ooh, cats fishy um so <laughs> you know there's just a lot going on there um but yeah that's pretty much me in that thank you right on thanks d um, next we have Kayla. Why don't you go next? Okay, I think the best thing I want to point out is that all three of us have brought up our cats in this panel. <laughs> um, hmm, suspicious. Um, yeah, I think, oh, but the tough part about my identity as it relates to like the queer community is that I came out relatively late, um, relatively late, like my early 20s. Um, so for a big part of that, like I knew that I was queer, but I didn't, I didn't feel like it was a big part of my identity because I was already in like an established relationship and I was like, no, it doesn't matter. Um, until I had like a really deep conversation with one of my friends and they were like, well, no, Kayla, this is, this is a big part of who you are. And I didn't really see it at the time. Um, and it hasn't been until 
like very recently, like when I came to Shack Shine, where I was like, okay, yeah, this is a big part of me. Um, how is this going to affect my work environment? And I just, I didn't say anything because coming into a corporate environment, it's not as, I was like scared. Like I knew it was a good place. I knew it was a great place to work. Um, but I was a little nervous about like coming out because again, it's a very male dominated field. And I don't know a lot of these men. Um, I don't know how open they are to that. Um, and then a big part of that was just like, finding somebody who I could trust, like my mentor at the time, my boss, and just kind of bringing in little like sprinkles of my identity being like, oh, it's Pride Week. Can I write the daily email this week and like throw in some like fun facts about Pride? And she was like, absolutely. I would love if you did that. And she acknowledged, she was like, I don't know anything about Pride really, because I'm a straight woman. I would love if you did this. And I was like, great. Absolutely. Um, and that's kind of been a part of disclosure and ownership as well. Like in the beginning, it was just like kind of subtly bringing it in there and then finally asking like, hey, this is something that's really important to me. Um, like putting in that we're a safe space for queer people to come and apply to. Um, can we do that into our job description? So that was a big part of like kind of disclosing that and owning that with my boss at the time. And she was like, absolutely. Um, that's been a big part of it. And just finding people who I trust as well at work and also recognizing that like where I work is a wonderful place to work. Like it's great. It's a very open environment and I do feel very safe about that, but I know that that's not the case for a lot of people. Um, so for me, like, I think similar to D, like I'm just, I'm just here. I've been very open. I now make jokes with my new boss about being queer all the time. And he is thankfully very receptive to that and kind of plays, plays along. Um, so I think if you're worried or unsure about how to approach this, like you just kind of have to feel out the organization. Um, and like most organizations, like obviously are very open to this. Um, it's just about feeling out who you can trust and having a mentor that you can trust and finding ways to like bring that part of your identity to work if you feel safe and comfortable doing so. Um, I hope that that helps and I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, also just as a reminder that um, feel free to take the conversation where you'd like to go in terms of the question. These are guidance um, prompts. Um, so absolutely. Thank you for your response, Kayla. Up next, Stephen. Um, it's really interesting because when I first started out with wanting to get into this work, I thought that my identity as a man was going to be more um, more important for the work. I was really interested in kind of working with men because growing up as a guy, we're socialized into not like expressing our emotions and our well-being and we don't advocate for ourselves when our mental health is struggling or if we're having issues with substance use, even though we're like statistically more likely to be abusing substances, things like that. So I thought that being a man was gonna, like, I was gonna start to be that representation, you know, be able to teach that like that vocabulary and that language to help uh, other men like you know, express themselves and to, to help them with their healing journey. And um, it was really interesting because uh, throughout my time at Humber, actually, um, you know, I was volunteering at the LGBTQ Resource Center and I met my partner in my program as well. And we've been together ever since, so that's been about five and a half years. Um, and he was a huge advocate for the US LGBTQ community. And he was always really like, we, like, we volunteered together at the Resource Center. And then um, he was always like really pushing that in all of our projects and presentations together and stuff like that. And I was never wanting to do that because I didn't want, I thought I'd be pigeonholing myself as like, you know, of course being a gay person wanting to help the gay community. Like it just didn't, it didn't, I didn't like, I felt like it was pigeonholing myself too much. But then once I actually got into the field, like I, my first job was at a men's shelter and that disconnect was like very apparent from the beginning, like uh, as much as like, you know, I was trying to, to break down those barriers and it happened every now and then, but by and large, like men were still men and they're not like that, that conditioning is not going to be so easy to break down. And then I was more interested in working with youth then because it's easier to intervene earlier in life and stuff. And so then that was a much better shift, but I still found that actually once I moved to the city and was working with youth, it was uh, youth who were members of the community that I was connecting with a lot more. And um, with the YMCA, they have multiple housing programs, and one of them is the first two as LGBTQ transitional housing program in the city, uh, Sprout House. And so I met lots of different, um, you know, queer folks there as well. And again, I was connecting with all the identities there a lot more than I was with the older men that I'd been working with before. Um, and so then I found that, again, my, my identity as a queer person was much more um, 
significant in allowing me to understand and connect with with folks and even to this day now with all the youth I connect with like there's um Gen Z is so much more like even if they're not all identifying as members of the community, there's just a general like queer energy amongst them that is a lot easier to connect with. So um, I'm really enjoying enjoying how that like has influenced my work. In terms of ownership and disclosure, um, I feel like it's like written on my forehead and I always say that I feel like I leave a trail of glitter everywhere I walk. So it's never been like, I don't know, I don't have to disclose it really to anybody. Um, but my first shift partner at the, at the men's shelter was like a 70 year old woman and she has been, a, had been a vet there for like 20 years. So she knew every single client in that shelter, even because they'd been in and out over the decades that she was working there. And her first piece of advice to me was don't try to be anything that you're not because you're working with vulnerable people and they're always on high alert. They're like the stuff they've been through, they will sniff out anything that's suspicious or strange. So if you're walking around here trying to be tough or trying to act like you're something that you're not, they're gonna smell it out right away and it's just gonna, it's not gonna work out for you. So don't try to be anything you're not. And I took that and ran with it. It's always been, so like I would sit in the office and like some guys would be like you know, having a serious moment or trying to have a conversation. And the question would come up would be, so can I ask you something? And right away, I'd just be like, yes, I'm gay. And they would laugh. Like, How did you know you're, you're, I was gonna ask you that? And it's like, I know that's what you wanna ask, but like, I'm not gonna front it or try to like, other people I know have to circumvent it and try to work around it. But for me, it was always about if I own it right away, I keep the power, right? Like there's no, there's no gossip to be had. There's no trying to like mess with me or anything. It's like, you know, I own it and you know that you have no power over me in that. And so, and it's just continued to work for me everywhere I've gone. I might be more tight lipped about it in certain situations compared to others, depending on, again, I think we as queer people can gauge our safety pretty well without even like explicitly noting it. But, um, but for the most part, I've always taught, told myself, don't try to be anything I'm not and just try to own it as much as possible. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm not, uh, recognizing that um, D, I didn't pose the latter part of the question. Is there anything you'd like to add in terms of like any tips that you might have for folks who might be worried or unsure about how to approach um, essentially just navigating identities and experiences and whether or not coming out is something that's top of mind? Anything to add there? So I want to make sure you had a chance to speak to it. Sure. Um, I guess something that I always tell folks is that it's okay not to have to disclose. Um, your safety is priority um, and you know how to keep yourself safe. Um, if, uh, if there are opportunities for you to be brave um, and share that, um, and you know that your safety is not in question, then for sure go ahead. But if you're like, nah, this doesn't feel right, or I don't think it's going to work out well for me to do that, it is okay to not. Um, and I, I, I say that, I say that knowing the there's lots of circumstances where, yeah, there's some in some certain spaces I go into where I'm just like, yeah, I can't. I wake up and people look at me and they're like, okay, you're a black individual cool but they don't have to know my sexual orientation or how i identify my gender um, and sometimes it's better that way so that's what i would say awesome thanks for that addition d i appreciate everyone's different take on these different parts um and steven i see your hand up feel free to jump in here yeah, I just want to, I also wanted to add to like, um, I've been really fortunate because like back piggybacking off the idea of the like, everyone knows to, to keep their safety first. Like I've been fortunate enough to work at organizations that not only have um, like to as LGBTQ um, non-discrimination like coded in policy, but um, like management at my current workplace, I had three, three members of, of upper management who were members of the community. And yeah, one was a gay man, one was a queer woman, one was a non-binary person. So I knew that if there was ever an issue, even without having a relationship with these people, I knew that if there was a problem in the workplace and I were to report it to one of them, that they would understand where I was coming from. And so I knew that that safety was kind of um, protected in that. And there were other coworkers also who were part of the community. So that safety was kind of already embedded within the culture and those th those things increased my feelings of safety. Whereas at my first job at the men's shelter, there was a lot less queer representation and I didn't trust necessarily the policy was going to protect me. So that's also something else to consider too, in terms of your feelings of safety. You gotta feel for the culture of the place and be on the lookout for responses to issues of 
uh, discrimination and harassment, right? Um, you know, I tried to advocate for an issue that happened between a client and a staff member and the staff member wasn't able to advocate in that meeting. I tried to advocate on their behalf and management let it slide after a slur was, was used against the staff member. And I was trying to advocate saying that this is not okay for the client to be used, there should be a consequence. But the management said that their that person wasn't there. I wasn't part of the situation. Therefore, there should there wasn't going to be any additional repercussion made. So that was a red flag. You know, it had nothing to do with me or my identity. It still was a red flag that this might be what happens when these situations come up. So if I did hear uh, a homophobic slur used by a client, I was letting it slide because it was like, what's going to happen? Probably nothing. So. These are the sorts of things that even though it's like written in policy and even though you're told, you know, report this to HR. I don't know. It's not always. You get you get the feeling of, of what's going to be taken seriously or not. Yeah, thanks for that addition, Stephen, and, and the the that there there's sometimes a discrepancy between what is written on paper and what is practiced, what is put into practice. And and I hear you folks talking about um, being able to trust like upper management to show up um, and see that in 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 operationalized, if you will, like used in in, in practice. So I, I definitely very much appreciate that. Um, and that kind of ties into the next question here. Where you, you know the three of you all spoke about um, challenges that you've had certainly in terms of you know D you, you talked about being the only black person on your team um, you know, and 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 Kayla you talked about having to proceed with caution to like assess essentially for safety right and for trust to can I trust my mentors to to look out for me or to have safe space for me and Stephen you just spoke about um, how much trust you can lean in with um, in terms of making sure there's a accountability right um, to ensure that's space is safer and all of that can certainly I'd imagine well I don't have to imagine because I certainly have lived experience but um, all of that can definitely make that sense of like disconnection and uncertainty really come up in your experience so this question here is about were there ever any times of uncertainty during your career path um, when you weren't sure where or how to move forward and how did you get through this period if you did. Um, we'll start with Kayla and then we'll go to Stephen and then Dee. Yeah, I'm sorry, there's a fire truck going by. So sorry if you can hear it. Um, I think, oh my gosh, there's another one. So sorry, guys. <laughs> um, I think before I get into like the challenges, I think the thing about trust that you brought up that all three of us have brought up. Um, the biggest thing for me is that when I entered when I started working at Shackshine, which was in the pandemic, um, I was coming out of like a relatively kind of toxic workplace where my, I'd been in that place for quite a while. Um, my boss, I didn't feel I could bring homophobic concerns to because I did find out one of my coworkers was homophobic. I requested not to work with that individual and I ended up having to work with that individual every week. Um, and while they were never outwardly homophobic towards me, it was things that I'd seen like online because we were friends on social media. And I was like, I, I really don't want to work with this person. Um, and I unfortunately like wasn't able to be heard with that part of my identity that it made me uncomfortable. So going into Shack Shine, I was like, okay, let's kind of feel this out. And I very quickly like learned that my mentors were very open, wonderful people, which was such a big relief to me. Um, and we're very open about like hearing about my experience as a queer woman um, and taking that into consideration. So I was really grateful and I'm disclosing this because I'm sure that one of them is going to watch this. So I want her to see this and realize that. Thank you, George, for always letting me trust you. <laughs> um, and in terms of just uncertainty during my career path. So I kind of mentioned this to Dee yesterday. Um, and I think we have like a similar experience. We graduated in the pandemic um, from Humber. I started my bachelor's degree in 2019, like September 2019, and my goal in doing that was to pursue an education, um, or sorry, a bachelor's of education afterwards. I was really passionate at the time about working with special education, which is why after doing my placement for the DSW program, like I continued volunteering because I loved the classroom I was in. I was really inspired by my teacher at the time. Um, 
who I was volunteering with, who was also a very open individual and made me feel very safe about being queer in a classroom. Um, and then like four months later, the pandemic hit and I was like, well, um, this is really stressful. And I was kind of nervous about going into another program because I was doing my degree during the pandemic online. And I was like, what does teaching look like in you know two years? Um, do I really wanna get myself into this and you know feel this burnout from doing everything online? Um, and just seeing like the constant struggles that teachers were going through with the pandemic. Um, so that was a really big challenge and a really big heartbreak for me because I was so excited, but I was just so scared of the unknown that I decided that wasn't on the table for me anymore. And that was a really, really tough pill to swallow. Um, like having to kind of shift my focus um, mid degree or not even mid degree, like the beginning of my degree. <laughs> that was really scary. Um, so that was a really big challenge that I faced and a lot of uncertainty where I wasn't really sure what to do. So I was laid off from my previous job, um, obviously as many of us were, and I started working at Shackshine. And my goal at the time, I said, this is just until the world goes back to normal. It's just until I graduate. Um, and if I'm not teaching, like maybe I go into a different field, maybe I do another certi certificate um, and still work with people. Uh, it's been almost three years and I'm still at Shackshine. I graduated from my degree last year um, and I'm super happy there. So that was kind of an, like a very surprising challenge that I wasn't expecting to face. Like, again, I had a really great mentor. She was really supportive of me, uh, regardless of my identity. She really fostered my like career development at Shackshine. Um, and that was a big part of how I got through that period. Like we talked in our one-to-ones about how I was feeling and how I wasn't sure what I was doing with my life and I just had no clue. And so she started working with me to develop certain skills that would help me proceed in Shackshine if that's what I wanted to do. Um, and that was kind of cool. So it went from me having absolutely no clue what I was doing and taking on a job temporarily until the world went back to normal to kind of falling into a career. Like I spoke about this um, with my partner and I was like, I had no idea three years later, this is where I'd be. Like leading the team that I started on, which there were like four people that I started um, because of the pandemic and other challenges. So it's, yeah, that was kind of my career path and a big uncertainty and a big hill. And I think we're passing it to Steven next, if I remember correctly. Sorry for the ramble. <laughs> I'm about to go on my big ramble. <laughs> um, so no, it's all good. Um, I'm trying to think about like what parts of the story to share and which parts aren't so necessary. Um, but, uh, when I started, I, w I was working, I started working full time at the sh youth shelter with the Y, uh, in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic hit. And so I worked, I worked that through all that chaos and shelter work is not easy folks, but I worked through all that until, um, December of that year before burning out. And then I switched to a different position at a, uh, queer specific organization. So all the staff and all the participants were members of the two LGBT community and I was um, super excited for that. It was a change. I was kind of moving more to like a food skills case manager kind of role. So it might be familiar with what that might sort of be, which played up to my strengths a bit more because I had, you know, a cooking background. So I was kind of hoping to flex more counseling skills with my cooking kind of knowledge and hoping that that would be something really with the, with the queer community. It was going to be really exciting. Um, and that only lasted six months for me, unfortunately. So after that, and I left that, I left that position after those six months. And that was really heartbreaking um, because here I'm finally in the city working with youth, working with queer youth, and I'm doing this work that I thought I was so passionate about. And um, I got to the point where I didn't know if I was, I was burning out so hard that I was like, I don't know if I'm cut out for this work. Like this is hard stuff and it's not going to get any easier. Like I'm dealing with the realities of legacies of trauma and, you know, issues that maybe I, I didn't necessarily experience myself, but I was trying to hold space for and didn't really know how to all the time, while also coping with the ongoing impacts of the pandemic and capitalism that's hitting the rest of us, right? So it was really hard. I was out of work for about three months and burned through all of my savings because living downtown isn't cheap. And, um, and I didn't know, I didn't know if I was going to continue in this career or not, because I had applied to master's programs and I got rejected or waitlisted. 
So I was thinking I'm not getting into grad school. So I'm not going to be able to go into the, the full unlicensed position that I want. And I'm still trying to work this frontline thing and it's too hard for me. So what am I thinking of, do, am I doing in this work? Um, but I think in the three months time, I, I did what I always like to do, which is I lead into my, my values. I read some books. I love a good self-help book. Brene Brown is my superhero. I love her so much. I don't know if anyone knows who she is. She's a social worker, but, um, um, I read, I, it wasn't her book though. I read, I read some book and it just reinvigorated me. I was like, I love this stuff. I love all the therapy and like mental health and, and ways that we support our well being. So I was just like, no, there's no way I can do anything else with my life. I need to keep trying and, and keep pushing. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, oh no, I ended up working an overnight position at a men's uh, addictions program, which was an interesting experience. But, um, but then a friend of mine let me know about this position with YSAP. So it was really just about like staying true to like what I knew I wanted to be doing. I like a long time ago, had this spark to go to want to become a therapist and and that's been my like mission ever since I can't imagine going through this life without supporting people in that in that way okay um <laughs> thanks um uncertainty <laughs> My life is full of uncertainty. Um, I guess how the position that I'm in currently, the uncertainty begins long before. Um, in I tell this story a lot. I'll tell the abridged version here. Um, but when I was in the eighth grade, um, I had a teacher who, I don't know if you remember this, but they used to stream you in high school. So they would put you in different levels. And... Um, my eighth grade teacher told my mother that they were gonna put me in like the really low academic courses because I was never gonna go to post-secondary education. Um, so it didn't make any sense for me to be streamed higher. Um, and she basically said that she had the final say to sign up on, on the paper. So no matter what my mom had said, um, that was just where I was gonna go. And I went through the, my entire high school experience feeling like I wasn't intelligent. I didn't have the ability to kind of achieve anything. Um, and I didn't have any direction. I didn't know where I was going to go. And I remember having a moment of being like, I can't let somebody else dictate where my life is going to end up. I have to take control of that. And then I have to move accordingly. Um, and it took me on a wild, wild ride. Um, I thought I was going to be a comedian. I didn't think <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be a social worker. Um, so I went to comedy school. I went to Humber for comedy. And when I graduated that, I was just like, okay, what next? Um, and I, I ended up getting into a cycle of being just like, okay, this job that I have now, this like random job is not working out for me. Um, I don't want to just have a, a random job. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense for me personally and where I was at the time. Um, so when I ended up going back to Humber and going to child and youth care, like, I was able to kind of exercise this muscle that I didn't know I really had, um, which was the muscle of learning. <laughs> I learned, I began my journey of learning how to learn. Um, and um, I had a teacher, uh, Wolfgang, and Wolfgang really, imp it, he helped me foster this curiosity and this ability to kind of like see things and achieve things and go after them. Um, he was like, you're really smart and you can do this. And I was like, man, you think I'm smart? Okay. And I ended up go get getting my bachelor's degree. Um, and after I got my bachelor's degree, I was like, I can do this. I can keep doing this. I can keep going. We're about to go. And, you know, I applied for my master's and that's where I'm at now. And I can't help but think that somewhere along that journey of trying to get to this particular spot that I'm at right now, that there was a, a plethora of hurdles that I had to overcome. Um, the pandemic was was a great one, <laughs> a great hurdle. Um, I remember being on online classes and being like, scratching my head like, mm, this is not really working for me. Um, I need to be in a classroom. I need to 
be able to focus my attention. Um, I have way too many tabs open and YouTube is right there. Um, it was really, it was a really big hurdle for me. Um, and it was also kind of burning me out a lot um, because I didn't have that separation of like going to school, coming home and maybe doing homework or whatever. It was like school was in my room. Everything else was in my room, um, and that was really hard. I couldn't separate those pieces. Um, but kind of having a little bit of a break um, in between helped me to kind of establish those boundaries um, and being able to kind of situate myself in, in, in a particular way. But, yeah, those, there was a lot of uncertainty <laughs> the way and there's still uncertainty sometimes I question whether or not I want to be in academia because it is a hostile environment um it is unwelcoming um and sometimes I have moments where I'm kind of re-stimulated back to being that eighth grader who's like ah I'm not smart I'm not supposed to be here I'm unwanted in these places um and I have to keep pushing through and I have to keep remembering that I'm rooting for me and there's also so many people who are rooting for me um, and that I have community that I can kind of fall back on when those times of uncertainty come up. Uh, awesome. Thanks, Dee. And thanks, everyone, for answering with all of your very personal stories that uh, of essentially overcoming the challenge challenges that has arisen from the pandemic. And the whole time I was thinking, in conclusion, we're all burnt out from the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Who isn't tired <laughs> at this point, right? Um, <laughs> if you're not tired, please give me advice. I would love some. Um, I'm sure other folks would too. Uh, so I, I really hear this strong sense of kind of just summarizing what you folks shared, like of adaptability, being flexible, and then and then also being curious and 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 learning, and that you all essentially have had some type of support or access to support. And so this next question here is essentially about that. Um, I'll quickly read this question here, but also um, I know it's centered on employees being supportive, um, but if you wanna talk you know, and ex be more expansive with your answer, I, I welcome you in speaking so. Um, Adi, you mentioned support from the community, so perhaps you can elaborate on that. Um, so this question here is, what do you want workplaces and organizations to know about supporting their employees who have multiple marginalized identities? Um, and we'll start with um, Steven, then we'll go to Dee and then Kayla. I think I just want to, I want to quickly touch on something that D was just mentioning though about like your your career journey. I don't I don't need to be the person saying this, but like um, that's that's not the first time I've heard that story about people being told that like they're not smart enough to achieve a certain level, and so the fa and and that you are now in a master's level of academia. And I just think about all the people that you like you paved that way for. Like that is so um, meaningful. I know it's what my partner is doing. Um, he's doing his PhD right now and he's um, Filipino and he's queer. And he's, he's really pushing to be that representation in academia for, for other queer people of color to, to, to see themselves reflected in that level of that work. So um, I think that's just, I know that that's really important to him and it's something I'm really supporting him with doing. And so I just also see that going on with you too. And I just think that's really awesome. So I had to, share that for that just surface from within um we're talking about what do workplaces and organizations to support people with multiple marginalized identities i think just listen to them like listen to what they're asking for it was it was the best response i could think of like you know marginalization impacts us and like when you have multiple levels of it it just it just keeps stacking up like we're gonna need more health care we're gonna need more days off we're gonna be more sensitive to stressors and stuff like that. There are things that go on in the world that will affect us just from hearing about it in a way that maybe our cis straight counterparts aren't going to understand why another attack on our community and there's multiple when we have multiple communities that we belong to, that's going to affect us. We're going to need more time off. Pay us more too while we're at it because again, that brings us like more like we bring more experience and more understanding and and I don't know like this is gonna sound so informal and maybe crass but like I talked to my partner about how like where would straight people be without us like 
I don't know, there's just, we bring such a level of creativity and compassion and understanding. Like, there's such a view on the world that queerness allows that like, like the straight world just doesn't have. And the few that do like, great, we we appreciate you, but like it, it, it's a universe, like it's ubiquitous among the queer community. And so, I don't know, I maybe I think too more than I should. But <laughs> Listen, listen, listen to people with multiple marginalized identities more and pay us more. I think that's the, the, the two big takeaways, I would say. Um, I fully support that completely. I'm here for it. I live for it. <laughs> um, yeah, it sounds really simple. Um, but yeah, listening has huge impacts huge impact like i would and i would add implementation um because it's like you can hear me baby but are you doing are you doing um that is something that i really yeah i really 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 echo that 100 percent um i was talking about community in the sense of like my folks um my core my people um I think there's a lot of things that are necessary for success and community is one of those things. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a biological tie or, you know, maybe a intersecting identity. Um, it could just be the people that are there for you, the people who are rooting you on, the people who are holding you up. Um, because there are moments when you get tired and you're weak and you need to be dragged to the finish line. And who are those people who are helping to drag you there? Um, those people are the, the pillars of support that are going to um, continue to kind of give you life. Um, but for organizations or workplaces, yeah, implement those things. Keep your word. Don't put a policy in there that's like literally fluff don't just write it there just to have it there actually follow through with those things um you know if people are saying i cannot work with this individual because i feel unsafe uh do what you gotta do move them around give them you know there's lots of things you don't have to necessarily come down like the long arm of the law and punish people but at least allow folks to go to work in a, a safer environment somewhere where they can actually achieve because I guess that's what you want, productivity. So allow them to be, I don't know, productive. Um, yeah, that's it, I'm done, end of thought. Yeah, just like listening, like you both nailed it right on the head, like listening to your employees and just including them in the decision so that you can listen to them. I feel like in large organizations, um, like frontline staff or like, like lower level employees, they're they're often overlooked. Like they'll send out a survey, everyone will answer it, and the front line is kind of ignored in those surveys. And that's that's not fair. That's really gross behavior because all the policies you're implementing, like realistically, is it affecting the person who is making the policy? Probably not. They probably have a lot more leeway to go about around those. Um, someone who's paid minimum wage or just above minimum wage doesn't have that flexibility. Um, so I think including them in decision making, like actually hearing them out, like you guys, like you both have said, like listening to them, that's the big part of it. Um, and like in terms, I think one thing I want to talk about too is the one multiple marginalized identity that like I can kind of relate to is um, having a mental illness on top of like being queer. Um, I think in the workplace, mental illness is often overlooked a lot. Um, and I think recognizing that how that impacts someone's productivity, how that impacts their tolerance for burnout, especially is a big one. So I think recognizing that not every person in your organization is going to work at the same pace and be able to get to a certain point without burning out. Um, someone's burnout tolerance is going to be a lot lower and that doesn't make them any less of a hard or productive worker. It just means their work needs to be modified. I think accommodations are overlooked a lot in workplaces. And I think that is a huge thing about people with multiple marginalized identities in the workplace being overlooked um, and recognizing that it's not, you know, one size fits all. It's, this doesn't work for me the same way it works for Steven and the same way it works for Dee and it needs to be adjusted for each individual. 
Great. Thank you folks so much for those answers. I wish there were enough or more employer employers here listening <laughs> in on that advice because it's so key and critical. Um, so we're at, we're at the last question here. And I feel like it sounds like you folks have already talked about support in your life or who has been significant in your career path. So maybe I'm going to put a twist to this to rephrasing the question as how would you like to support yourself if you could go back in time? What would the what would that advice or guidance like what type of advice or guidance would you give yourself um, if, as you were sort of navigating all these different obstacles and challenges? I'll give you folks like a, a second to <laughs> think about your answer. Feel free to say no and just answer the question itself. Like you can always opt out, um, but wanted to throw that twist in there. Um, and uh, we'll start with whoever's ready <laughs> this time. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go, I got it, I got it. Um, for myself, I would say not everybody who's standing beside you wants you to win. And that is okay to let birds fly. Um, I think for myself, I was cl clinging to relationships to be in community with folks who were not there for me, who were not in community with me. Um, they were in community for themselves. <laughs> Um, and that was a really hard thing to deal with because any kind of um, dissolving of a relationship, whether that's a friendship or a familial relationship or a romantic one um, in the middle of like studies or career stuff, uncertainty is always hard and you have to take care of yourself in a sense. Um, and sometimes taking care of yourself is saying, I'm going to love you with a long spoon or we can't be in a community. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I showed up for myself a lot as much as I possibly could, and you definitely need to have people who are gonna show up for you as well. So that's, that's what I would say to myself. Poor me. <laughs> Sending lots of love to your past self and current self. <laughs> uh, any Kayla or Steven, are you folks ready to answer? Feel yeah. Free to answer um, yeah, Dee, that's, I wish I could give myself that advice too. Like recognize who's not supporting me. I'm like a little emotional thinking about that right now. <laughs> um, for both of our past selves for not kind of recognizing that until much later for, for me at least. Um, I think the other big piece of advice I'd give myself is go to therapy a lot sooner. <laughs> um, like I, I think that was a big hurdle for me to come for me to cross. Um, I think growing up therapy was always seen as like, Oh, you only go to that. Like, and it was like, it was so negative. It was just such a negative connotation. And when I finally did it, it had such like a huge impact on my life and like what I was doing and how I felt about myself. So I think anyone in any career path, like go, go to therapy. Like you don't, I think everyone should be in therapy personally. Like I think everyone could benefit from this. Um, and find a therapist that you trust and that aligns with your values. Like don't just stick with the first therapist because you've gone through all the intake and like they know your whole story. Like if you're not vibing with that therapist, find a new one. That is, they're literally paid to do the intake and hear you out and get get a therapist. Go to go to therapy, young Kayla. <laughs> yeah, I think similarly. I think I wouldn't just say therapy, the younger Stephen, but like just like reach out for help sooner. I think like I was do you might agree I was like trying to be pre-med and I thought like you know growing up in high school I was like a typical overachieving little gay boy I was aiming to be the absolute best at everything and so I got to university thinking I'm the top kid in, from my high school this is like I can do it all and I could not um very quickly learned I could not but I pretended that I could still and I kept fighting that for a very long time and that like ate away at my everything so I 
I wish I could have just been like, go to the writing center and like learn how to properly like write an essay now at the university level. Like instead, you're struggling, like you can't get a thought out and you know how to write, but you're like struggling right now. Go get help for it. The math isn't, make, the physics is too hard for you. Like go to the physics help, whatever, go visit the TA, ask for the help. I was too afraid of see, talking to my professors for four years because I thought they would see me as an ant and that they wouldn't want to step on me. Whereas like I discovered at the very end of my fourth year that they were like, oh no, we actually want to like, we want you to succeed. Like we want, we would have helped you. Like maybe not like you don't see the prof or something that's on the syllabus, but like, you know, like th there are people who are there to help you. And therapy was obviously huge for that too. Um, so I wish that I just reached out for help a lot sooner because there would have been a lot less, even if like not all, everything gets managed, like a lot of, there'd be a lot less stuff to deal with. That's what I try to do. That's what like inspired me to do what I do now is like, I'm not going to change someone's whole life, but like, if I can just steer you a little bit away from that, like whatever damage we can avoid would be nice. Right. Um, but there's been so, that being said, like there were so many people that did help me along the way. And that's why I think that it's like, once I was able to start accepting help, there were so many people who like have really helped me get to where I am. And like, I think again, like Brene Brown, like all of her TED talks and books and everything has just been so pivotal for me. Um, Matt Dempsey, who is a gay therapist in California. I emailed him once cause I saw him on YouTube and I was like, I want to be a therapist one day any advice and he emailed me back that made me feel so validated and then there's like you know my instructors at um at Humber shout out to Kat Mettler you are my like forever fave we love you um trauma-informed practice has been a game changer for the whole world and every alumnus from the ADMH program um um my partner of course who has you know like helped support me with like my whole career and stuff and our life together. It, uh, there's just so many people. Once I was able to start asking, accepting help, um, it got better. And uh, accepting interdependence rather than pure independence, right? So. Yeah, thank you folks for really how self-compassionate you all have been, even in your own answers <laughs> in this moment that I kind of spurred and threw it onto you. Um, I really appreciate how, um, yeah, the, the the advice you're giving both about yourself and to folks um, in the audience. I'm, <clears throat> I'm hoping that folks are able to get away quite a bit. And, and, and we even have a chat uh, message in the chat here thanking you folks for how insightful it's been. Um, so we're wrapping up at this point and shifting into the question, the Q&A uh, portion of our session here. Um, so before we go to all the questions that potentially the folks may have. Um, I wanted to just open it up to see if anything else that you folks may want to share that you haven't gotten a chance to based on our conversation. I'm going to say something. Yeah, please. Um, I guess my thing is, it's like, don't be afraid of what you may consider failure. Um, I think there's a lot of times, I hear this a lot, where folks do not try to achieve or they don't go for things or they don't try to like make their dreams happen because they're afraid of failing. Um, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. And I think that sometimes when we see those things and we go, hmm, maybe I should have done this or I could have tried this. It's okay to do that. But remember that you can always try again, <laughs> try something different. Um, maybe move over and try this new thing or that new thing. Um, don't let the fear of failure stop you from achieving or reaching, um, especially in your career. It's like, I don't have enough experience. Like, the, apply because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what they're going to see. You don't know how they're making connections of your experience. And you could miss out on an opportunity that was for you. So that's it. Yeah, thanks for that last addition there. I always say there's a ghost job description that you don't get to see. <laughs> um, and so you never know what they're actually looking for and always just apply to give it a try, right? Um, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm.